Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the January 2021 edition of Socialism for All. And this is an audiobook of War is a Racket by Major General Smedley Butler. Thanks to Radical.org, R-A-T-I-C-A-L.org for hosting this file and many others. So Smedley Darlington Butler was born in 1881. He became a U.S. Marine, eventually becoming a major general in the Marine Corps. He retired in the 30s uh, and then became a lecturer. He ran for Senate in 1932, died in 1940. Uh, If you've ever heard of the business plot, this was an alleged uh, coup attempt that never got off the ground, reported by this guy, Smedley Butler. He said that people uh, from representing J.P. Morgan and the other financial firms, but I think particularly J.P. Morgan, um, approached him about rounding up some guys and some soldiers and doing a march on Washington to see about uh, overthrowing FDR on behalf of the uh, financial firms. Uh, the New York Times wrote a you know uh, article denouncing the whole thing as being without evidence. Anyway, um, it certainly would be in line with some other things that we have seen, like the March on Rome that Mussolini did, etc. So anyway, let's get into the audiobook, starting with chapter one. War is a racket. War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of the people. Only a small, inside group knows what it is about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. Out of war, a few people make huge fortunes. In the World War, that would be World War I, a mere handful garnered the profits of the conflict. At least 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. That many admitted their huge blood gains in their income tax returns. How many other war millionaires falsified their tax returns, no one knows. How many of these war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them dug a trench? How many of them knew what it meant to go hungry in a rat-infested dugout? How many of them spent sleepless, frightened nights ducking shells and shrapnel and machine gun bullets? How many of them parried a bayonet thrust of an enemy? How many of them were wounded or killed in battle? Out of war, nations acquire additional territory if they are victorious. They just take it. This newly acquired territory promptly is exploited by the few, the self-same few who wrung dollars out of blood in the war. The general public shoulders the bill. And what is this bill? This bill renders a horrible accounting. Newly placed gravestones, mangled bodies, shattered minds, broken hearts and homes, economic instability, depression and all its attendant miseries, back-breaking taxation for generations and generations. For a great many years, as a soldier, I had a suspicion that war was a racket. Not until I retired to civil life did I fully realize it. Now that I see the international war clouds gathering as they are today, I must face it and speak out. Again, they are choosing sides. France and Russia met and agreed to stand side by side. Italy and Austria hurried to make a similar agreement. Poland and Germany cast sheep's eyes at each other, forgetting for the nonce, one unique occasion, their dispute over the Polish corridor. The assassination of King Alexander of Yugoslavia complicated matters. Yugoslavia and Hungary, long bitter enemies, were almost at each other's throats. Italy was ready to jump in, but France was waiting, so was Czechoslovakia. All of them are looking ahead to war. Not the people, not those who fight and pay and die, only those who foment wars and remain safely at home to profit. There are 40 million men under arms in the world today, and our statesmen and diplomats have the temerity to say that war is not in the making. Hell's bells, are these 40 million men being trained to be dancers? Not in Italy, to be sure. Premier Mussolini knows what they are being trained for. He, at least, is frank enough to speak out. Only the other day, Il Duce in International Conciliation, 
the publication of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace said, quote, and above all, fascism, the more it considers and observes the future and the development of humanity quite apart from political considerations of the moment, believes neither in the possibility nor the utility of perpetual peace. War alone brings up to its highest tension all human energy and puts the stamp of nobility upon the people who have the courage to meet it, unquote. Undoubtedly, Mussolini means exactly what he says. His well-trained army, his great fleet of planes, and even his navy are ready for war, anxious for it, apparently. His recent stand at the side of Hungary in the latter's dispute with Yugoslavia showed that and the hurried mobilization of his troops on the Austrian border after the assassination of Dolphus showed it too. There are others in Europe, too, whose saber-rattling presages war sooner or later. Herr Hitler, with his rearming Germany and his constant demands for more and more arms, is an equal, if not greater, menace to peace. France only recently increased the term of military service for its youth from a year to 18 months. Yes, all over, nations are camping in their arms. The mad dogs of Europe are on the loose. In the Orient, the maneuvering is more adroit. Back in 1904, when Russia and Japan fought, we kicked out our old friends the Russians and backed Japan. Then our very generous international bankers were financing Japan. Now the trend is to poison us against the Japanese. What does the, quote, open door policy to China mean to us? Our trade with China is about $90 million a year. Or the Philippine Islands. We have spent about $600 million in the Philippines in 35 years, and we, our bankers and industrialists and speculators, capitalists, have private investments there of less than $200 million. Then, to save that China trade of about $90 million, or to protect these private investments of less than $200 million in the Philippines, we would be all stirred up to hate Japan and go to war, a war that might well cost us tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of lives of Americans, and many more hundreds of thousands of physically maimed and mentally unbalanced men. Of course, for this loss, there would be a compensating profit. Fortunes would be made. Millions and billions of dollars would be piled up by a few munitions makers, bankers, shipbuilders, manufacturers, meat packers, speculators. They would fare well. Yes, they are getting ready for another war. Why shouldn't they? It pays high dividends. But what does it profit the men who are killed? What does it profit their mothers and sisters, their wives and their sweethearts? What does it profit their children? What does it profit anyone except the very few to whom war means huge profits? Yes, and what does it profit the nation? Take our own case. Until 1898, we didn't own a bit of territory outside the mainland of North America. At that time, our national debt was a little more than $1 billion. Then we became, quote, internationally minded. We forgot, or shunted aside, the advice of the father of our country. We forgot George Washington's warning about, quote, entangling alliances. We went to war we acquired outside territory. At the end of the World War period, as a direct result of our fiddling in international affairs, our national debt had jumped to over $25 billion. Our total favorable trade balance during the 25-year period was about $24 billion. Therefore, on a purely bookkeeping basis, we ran a little behind year for year, and that foreign trade might well have been ours without the wars. It would have been far cheaper, not to say safer, for the average American who pays the bills to stay out of foreign entanglements. For a very few, this racket, like bootlegging and other underworld rackets, brings fancy profits, but the cost of operations is always transferred to the people, who do not profit. That's the end of chapter one. Quick comment from S4A. What he's talking about here are called externalities. These are costs that are externalized from the enterprise, corporation, business, whatever, onto society. They are externalized from the institution to the outside. That would be us. Anytime that it is possible, capitalists seek to privatize profits and socialize losses. That is exactly what Smedley Butler is describing. And I'll go a step further here, which is basically that capitalism 
he talks here about the uh, forgetting the advice of George Washington to avoid entangling alliances. Well, it's really not that simple because once capitalism grows to a certain point and it's saturated its domestic market, it absolutely has to move abroad. Um, so this is basically imperialism. Capitalism, once it becomes uh, of sufficient size, uh, must engage in these wars to determine questions of dominance and market control and everything else. It simply must keep expanding by force as necessary. That is imperialism. All right, chapter two. Who makes the profits? The world war, rather our brief participation in it, has cost the United States some $52 billion. Figure it out. That means $400 to every American man, woman, and child. And we haven't paid the debt yet. We are paying it, our children will pay it, and our children's children probably still will be paying the cost of that war. The normal profits of a business concern in the United States are 6, 8, 10, and sometimes 12%. But wartime profits, ah, that is another matter. 20, 60, 100, 300, and even 1,800%. The sky is the limit. All that traffic will bear. Uncle Sam has the money, let's get it. Of course, it isn't put that crudely in wartime. It is dressed into speeches about patriotism, love of country, and we must put all our shoulders to the wheel, but the profits jump and leap and skyrocket and are safely pocketed. Let's just take a few examples. Take our friends the DuPonts, the powder people. Didn't one of them testify before a Senate committee recently that their powder won the war? Or saved the world for democracy? Or something? How did they do in the war? They were a patriotic corporation. Well, the average earnings of the DuPonts for the period 1910 to 1914 were $6 million a year. It wasn't much, but the DuPonts managed to get along on it. Now let's look at their average yearly profit during the war years, 1914 to 1918. $58 million a year profit, we find. Nearly 10 times that of normal times, and the profits of normal times were pretty good. An increase in profits of more than 950%. Take one of our little steel companies that patriotically shunted aside the making of rails and girders and bridges to manufacture war materials. Well, their 1910 to 1914 yearly earnings averaged $6 million. Then came the war, and, like loyal citizens, Bethlehem Steel promptly turned to munitions making. Did their profits jump, or did they let Uncle Sam in for a bargain? Well, their 1914 to 1918 average was $49 million a year. Or, let's take U.S. Steel. The normal earnings during the five-year period prior to the war were $105 million per year. Not bad. Then, along came the war, and up went the profits. The average yearly profit for the period 1914 to 1918 was $240 million. Not bad. There you have some of the steel and powder earnings. Let's look at something else. A little copper, perhaps. That always does well in war times. Anaconda, for instance. Average yearly earnings during the pre-war years, 1910 to 1914, of $10 million. During the war years, 1914 to 1918, profits leap to $34 million per year. Or Utah copper. Average of $5 million per year during the 1910 to 1914 period. Jumped to an average of 21 million year yearly profits for the war period. Let's group these five with three smaller companies. The total yearly average profits of the pre-war period 1910 to 1914 were 137,480,000. Then along came the war. The average yearly profits for this group skyrocketed to 408,300,000. A little increase in profits of approximately 200%. Does war pay? It paid them, but they aren't the only ones. There are still others. Let's take leather. For the three-year period before the war, the total profits of Central Leather Company were 3,500,000. That was approximately 1,167,000 a year. Well, in 1916, Central Leather returned a profit of $15 million, a small increase of 1,100%. That's all. 
the General Chemical Company averaged a profit for the three years before the war of a little over 800000 a year. Came the war, and the profits jumped to $12 million, a leap of 1,400%. International Nickel Company, and you can't have a war without nickel, showed an increase in profits from a mere average of $4 million a year to $73 million yearly. Not bad, an increase of more than 1,700%. American Sugar Refining Company averaged $2 million a year for the three years before the war. In 1916, a profit of $6 million was recorded. Listen to Senate Document Number 259, the 65th Congress reporting on corporate earnings and government revenues. Considering the profits of 122 meat packers, 153 cotton manufacturers, 299 garment makers, 49 steel plants, and 340 coal producers during the war. Profits under 25% were exceptional. For instance, the coal companies made between 100% and 7,856% on their capital stock during the war. The Chicago Packers doubled and tripled their earnings. And let us not forget the bankers who financed the Great War. If anyone had the cream of the profits, it was the bankers. Being partnerships rather than incorporated organizations, they don't have to report to stockholders. And their profits were as secret as they were immense. How the bankers made their millions and their billions, I do not know, because those little secrets never became public, even before a Senate investigatory body. But here's how some of the other patriotic industrialists and speculators chiseled their way into war profits. Take the shoe people. They like war. It brings business with abnormal profits. They made huge profits on sales abroad to our allies. Perhaps, like the munitions manufacturers and armament makers, they also sold to the enemy. For a dollar is a dollar, whether it comes from Germany or from France. But they did well by Uncle Sam, too. For instance, they sold Uncle Sam 35 million pairs of hobnailed service shoes. There were 4 million soldiers. Eight pairs, and more, to a soldier. My regiment, during the war, had only one pair to a soldier. Some of these shoes probably are still in existence. They were good shoes. But when the war was over, Uncle Sam has a matter of 25 million pairs left over. Bought and paid for. Profits recorded and pocketed. There was still lots of leather left. So the leather people sold your Uncle Sam hundreds of thousands of McClellan saddles for the cavalry. But there wasn't any American cavalry overseas. Somebody had to get rid of this leather, however. Somebody had to make a profit in it, so we had a lot of McClellan saddles, and we probably have those yet. Also, somebody had a lot of mosquito netting. They sold your Uncle Sam 20 million mosquito nets for the use of the soldiers overseas. I suppose the boys were expected to put it over them as they tried to sleep in muddy trenches, one hand scratching cooties on their backs and the other making passes at scurrying rats. Well, not one of these mosquito nets ever got to France. Anyhow, these thoughtful manufacturers wanted to make sure that no soldier would be without his mosquito net, so 40 million additional yards of mosquito netting were sold to Uncle Sam. There were pretty good profits in mosquito netting in those days, even if there were no mosquitoes in France. I suppose if the war had lasted just a little longer, the enterprising mosquito netting manufacturers would have sold your Uncle Sam a couple of consignments of mosquitoes to plant in France so that more mosquito netting would be in order. Airplane and engine manufacturers felt they too should get their just profits out of this war. Why not? Everybody else was getting theirs. So one billion dollars, count them if you live long enough, was spent by Uncle Sam in building airplane engines that never left the ground. Not one plane or motor out of the billion dollars worth ordered ever got into a battle in France. Just the same, the manufacturers made their little profit of 30, 100, or perhaps 300 percent. Undershirts for soldiers cost 14 cents to make, and Uncle Sam paid 30 to 40 cents each for them, a nice little profit for the undershirt manufacturer. And the stocking manufacturer, and the uniform manufacturers, and the cap manufacturers, and the steel helmet manufacturers, all got theirs. Why, when the war was over, some four million sets of equipment, knapsacks, and the things that go to fill them, crammed warehouses on this side. 
Now they're being scrapped because the regulations have changed the contents, but the manufacturers collected their wartime profits on them, and they will do it all over again the next time. There were lots of brilliant ideas for profit-making during the war. One very versatile patriot sold Uncle Sam 12 dozen 48-inch wrenches. Oh, they were very nice wrenches. The only trouble was that there was only one nut ever made that was large enough for these wrenches. That is the one that holds the turbines at Niagara Falls. Well, after Uncle Sam had bought them and the manufacturer had pocketed the profit, the wrenches were put on freight cars and shunted all around the United States in an effort to find a use for them. When the armistice was signed, it was indeed a sad blow to the wrench manufacturer. He was just about to make some nuts to fit the wrenches. Then he planned to sell these two to your Uncle Sam. Still another had the brilliant idea that colonels shouldn't ride in automobiles, nor should they even ride on horseback. One has probably seen a picture of Andy Jackson riding in a buckboard. Well, some 6,000 buckboards were sold to Uncle Sam for the use of colonels. Not one of them was used, but the buckboard manufacturer got his war profit. The shipbuilders felt they should come in on some of it too. They built a lot of ships that made a lot of profit, some more than $3 billion worth. Some of the ships were all right, but $635 million worth of them were made of wood and wouldn't float. The seams opened up and they sank. We paid for them though, and somebody pocketed the profits. It's been estimated by statisticians and economists and researchers that the war cost your Uncle Sam $52 billion. Of this sum, $39 billion was expended in the actual war itself. This expenditure yielded $16 billion in profits. That is how the 21,000 billionaires and millionaires got that way. This $16 billion in profits is not to be sneezed at. It's quite a tidy sum, and it went to a very few. A uh, quick comment here, uh, speaking of sums not to be sneezed at, um, I'm mentioning a lot of dollar amounts here. So in 1914 dollars compared to today, 2021, um, multiply by about 25, 25 to 26. So $1 million then equals $25 million now, $1 billion then equals $25 billion now. Uh, four billion dollars then equals a hundred billion dollars now. All right, so that's sixteen billion dollars, actually four hundred billion dollars in in today's money. All right, back to the text. The Senate Committee, the Nye Committee, probe of the munitions industry and its wartime profits, despite its sensational disclosures, has hardly scratched the surface. Even so, it has had some effect. The State Department has been studying, quote, for some time, methods of keeping out of war. The War Department suddenly decides it has a wonderful plan to spring. The administration names a committee, with the War and Navy Departments ably represented under the chairmanship of a Wall Street speculator to limit profits in wartime. To what extent isn't suggested? Hmm. Possibly the profits of 300 and 600 and 1600 percent of those who turned blood into gold in the World War would be limited to some smaller figure. Apparently, however, the plan does not call for any limitation of losses, that is, the losses of those who will fight the war. As far as I have been able to ascertain, there is nothing in the scheme to limit a soldier to the loss of but one eye or one arm, or to limit his wounds to one or two or three, or to limit the loss of life. There is nothing in this scheme, apparently, that says not more than 12% of a regiment shall be wounded in battle, or that not more than 7% in a division shall be killed. Of course, the committee cannot be bothered with such trifling matters. Chapter 3. Who Pays the Bills? Who provides the profits? These nice little profits of 20, 100, 300, 1500, and 1800 percent? We all pay them in taxation. We paid the bankers their profits when we bought Liberty Bonds. By the way, just a quick comment here. If you have a socialist country that doesn't make shoes and gunpowder and all the other stuff he's talking about here, saddles and boats and whatever, you're not making them for profit, this entire issue goes away. The entire issue goes away. Because 
you have an economy that is run on a not-for-profit basis. All of the surplus gets folded back into the public and they just don't produce things that they don't need, uh, particularly to this extent, because there's no profit incentive to produce things, to, to profiteer and scam the government, you know, by selling them those 48 wrenches or stuff like that. This is a capitalism specific problem. All right. So let's back that up. We all pay these profits in taxation. We paid the bankers their profits when we bought Liberty bonds at $100 and sold them back at 84 or 86 to the bankers. These bankers collected the $100 plus. It was a simple manipulation. The bankers controlled the security marts. It was easy for them to depress the price of the bonds. Then all of us, the people, got frightened and sold the bonds at $84 or $86. The bankers bought them. Then these same bankers stimulated a boom and government bonds went to par and above. Then the bankers collected their profits. But the soldier pays the biggest part of the bill. If you don't believe this, visit the American cemeteries on the battlefields abroad. Or visit any of the veterans' hospitals in the United States. On a tour of the country, in the midst of which I am at the time of this writing, I have visited 18 government hospitals for veterans. In them are a total of about 50,000 destroyed men, men who were the pick of the nation 18 years ago. The very able chief surgeon at the government hospital at Milwaukee, where there are 3,800 of the living dead, told me that mortality among veterans is three times as great as among those who stayed at home. Boys with a normal viewpoint were taken out of the fields and offices and factories and classrooms and put into the ranks. There, they were remolded. They were made over. They were made to about face, to regard murder as the order of the day. Quick comment. We would say, sociologically speaking, that they were re-socialized into the norms and standards of the armed forces. They were put shoulder to shoulder and... Through mass psychology, they were entirely changed. We used them for a couple of years and trained them to think nothing at all of killing or of being killed. Then, suddenly, we discharged them and told them to make another about-face. This time, they had to do their own readjustment without mass psychology, without officers' aid and advice, and without nationwide propaganda. We didn't need them anymore, so we scattered them about without any three-minute or liberty loan speeches or parades. Many, too many, of these fine young boys are eventually destroyed mentally because they could not make that final about-face alone and reintegrate into society. In the government hospital in Marion, Indiana, 1,800 of these boys are in pens, 500 of them in a barracks with steel bars and wires all around outside the buildings and on the porches. These already have been mentally destroyed. These boys don't even look like human beings. The looks on their faces. Physically, they're in good shape. Mentally, they're gone. There are thousands and thousands of these cases, and more and more are coming in all the time. The tremendous excitement of the war, the sudden cutting off of that excitement, the young boys couldn't stand it. That's a part of the bill. So much for the dead, they have paid their part of the war profits. So much for the mentally and physically wounded, they're now paying their share of the war profits. But the others paid too. They paid with heartbreaks when they tore themselves away from their firesides and their families to don the uniform of Uncle Sam on which a profit had been made. They paid another part in the training camps where they were regimented and drilled while others took their jobs and their places in the lives of their communities. They paid for it in the trenches, where they shot and were shot, where they were hungry for days at a time, where they slept in the mud and the cold and in the rain, with the moans and shrieks of the dying for a horrible lullaby. But don't forget, the soldier paid part of the dollars and cents bill too. Up to and including the Spanish-American War, we had a prize system, and soldiers and sailors fought for money. During the Civil War, they were paid bonuses in many instances before they went into service. The government, or states, paid as high as $1,200 for an enlistment. In the Spanish-American War, they gave prize money. When we captured any vessels, 
the soldiers all got their share, at least they were supposed to. Then it was found that we could reduce the cost of wars by taking all the prize money and keeping it, but conscripting or drafting the soldier anyway. Then soldiers couldn't bargain for their labor. Everyone else could bargain, but the soldier couldn't. Napoleon once said, quote, All men are enamored of decorations. They positively hunger for them. Unquote. So by developing the Napoleonic system, the metal business, the government learned it could get soldiers for less money because the boys liked to be decorated. Until the Civil War, there were no medals. Then the Congressional Medal of Honor was handed out. It made enlistments easier. After the Civil War, no new medals were issued until the Spanish-American War. In the World War, we used propaganda to make the boys accept conscription. They were made to feel ashamed if they didn't join the army. So vicious was this war propaganda that even God was brought into it. With few exceptions, our clergymen joined in the clamor to kill, 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 to kill the Germans. God is on our side. It is his will that the Germans be killed. And in Germany, the good pastors called upon the Germans to kill the Allies, to please the same God. That was a part of the general propaganda built up to make people war-conscious and murder-conscious. Beautiful ideals were painted for our boys who were sent out to die. This was the, quote, war to end all wars. Comment, yeah, that didn't really work out like that. This was the, quote, war to make the world safe for democracy. Comment, yeah, same, same deal, same, uh, not, didn't happen. No one mentioned to them, as they marched anyway, that their going and their dying would mean huge war profits. No one told these American soldiers that they might be shot down by bullets made by their own brothers here. No one told them that the ships on which they were going to cross might be torpedoed by submarines built with U.S. patents. They were just told it was going to be, quote, a glorious adventure. Thus, having stuffed patriotism down their throats, it was decided to make them help pay for the war, too. So we gave them the large salary of $30 a month. All they had to do for this munificent sum was to leave their dear ones behind, give up their jobs, lie in swampy trenches, eat canned willy when they could get it, and kill and kill and kill and be killed. But wait, half of that wage just a little more than the riveter in a shipyard or a laborer in a munitions factory safe at home made in a day, was promptly taken from him to support his dependents so that they would not become a charge upon his community. Then we made him pay what amounted to accident insurance, something the employer pays for in an enlightened state, and that cost him $6 a month. He had less than $9 a month left. Then, the most crowning insolence of all, he was virtually blackjacked into paying for his own ammunition, clothing, and food by being made to buy Liberty Bonds. Most soldiers got no money at all on paydays. We made them buy Liberty Bonds at $100, and then we bought them back, when they came back from the war and couldn't find work, at $84 and $86. And the soldiers bought about $2 billion worth of these bonds. Yes, the soldier pays the greater part of the bill. His family pays, too. They pay it in the same heartbreak that he does. As he suffers, they suffer. At nights, as he lay in the trenches and watched shrapnel burst about him, then lay home in their beds and tossed sleeplessly, his father, his mother, his wife, his sisters, his brothers, his sons, and his daughters. When he returned home minus an eye, or minus a leg, or with his mind broken, they suffered too, as much as, and even sometimes more than he. Yes, and they too contributed their dollars to the profits of the munitions makers, and bankers and shipbuilders, and the manufacturers, and the speculators made. They too bought liberty bonds, and contributed to the profit of the bankers after the armistice in the hocus-pocus of manipulated liberty bond prices. And even now, the families of the wounded men and of the mentally broken and those who were never able to readjust themselves are still suffering and still paying. And that's the end of chapter three, two chapters remaining. Chapter four, how to smash this racket. Well, it's a racket, all right. A few profit and the many pay. But there is a way to stop it. 
You can't end it by disarmament conferences. You can't eliminate it by peace parlays at Geneva. Well-meaning but impractical groups can't wipe it out by resolutions. It can be smashed effectively only by taking the profit out of war. Quick comment here. This is still going on today. There are uh, weapons manufacturers and other military suppliers and you know manufacturers all over the United States. They're in all different states. The military industrial complex absolutely has the politicians by the you-know-what because if they ever cut funding, it's going to mean a loss of jobs in their community. And frankly, there's not a hell of a lot of other jobs in many places. It's completely dependent on this war economy, which is just profit. It's just piling up equipment that will never be used. Uh, you may have seen the pictures of the, the, uh, the planes that are just like, there's like hundreds and hundreds of never used military planes. Just, and, and now they're obsolete. But they were built, why? To make these companies rich. And, uh, you know, incidentally, this was written uh, before World War II. Social democracy did not get the United States out of the Great Depression. World War II did. It was all of this wartime production, as well as, um, I mean, both these world wars were basically wars between industrial would-be competitors. There were wars between imperialists. And the U.S. won. It came out, well, and the Soviet Union sustained heavier losses, but also came out victorious, air quotes. But uh, basically, the U.S. didn't have, you know, capitalist competitors in Western Europe. They were reduced to rubble. That's what brought the U.S. out of the slump. And, I mean, we're in that slump today, except, you know, like the heroin junkie where you keep chasing the high, nothing's going to do it. The tolerance is there. The economy is crap. Uh, but, you know, kind of the only people who are making money is private prisons and war profiteers. And that's part of the reason. I mean, capitalism needs to keep expanding by war. Uh, and by God, the military manufacturers are going to make sure that it keeps going that way and that we never take a turn away from capitalism. They will do their best to make sure that. And we as anti-capitalists, as socialists are going to have to take them on politically and in every other way, economically, if we're ever going to get out of this late-stage capitalism, advanced imperialism. Uh, these are some of the entrenched interests that Butler's laying out here. All right, so back to the audiobook. The only way to smash this racket is to conscript capital and industry and labor before the nation's manhood can be conscripted. One month before the government can conscript the young men of the nation, it must conscript capital and industry and labor. Let the officers and the directors and the high-powered executives of our armament factories and our munitions makers and our shipbuilders and our airplane builders and the manufacturers of all the other things that provide profit in wartime, as well as the bankers and the speculators, be conscripted to get $30 a month the same wage as the lads in the trenches get. Let the workers in these plants get the same wages. All the workers, all presidents, all executives, all directors, all managers, all bankers. Yes, and all generals, and all admirals, and all officers, and all politicians, and all government office holders. Everyone in the nation be restricted to a monthly total income not to exceed that paid to the soldier in the trenches. Let all these kings and tycoons and masters of business and all those workers in industry and all our senators and governors and majors pay half of their monthly $30 wage to their families and pay war risk insurance and buy liberty bonds. Why shouldn't they? They aren't running any risk of being killed or of having their bodies mangled or their minds shattered. They aren't sleeping in muddy trenches. They aren't hungry. The soldiers are. Give capital and industry and labor 30 days to think it over, and you will find by that time there will be no war. That will smash the war racket, that and nothing else. Maybe I'm a little too optimistic. Capital still has some to say. So capital won't permit the taking of the profit out of war until the people, those who do the suffering and still pay the price, make up their minds that those they elect to office shall do their bidding and not that of the profiteers. 
Another step necessary in this fight to smash the war racket is the limited plebiscite to determine whether a war should be declared. A plebiscite not of all the voters, but merely of those who would be called upon to do the fighting and dying. There wouldn't be very much sense in having a 76-year-old president of a munitions factory or the flat-footed head of an international banking firm or the cross-eyed manager of a uniform manufacturing plant, all of whom see visions of tremendous profits in the event of war, voting on whether the nation should go to war or not. They never would be called upon to shoulder arms, to sleep in a trench, and to be shot. Only those who would be called upon to risk their lives for the country should have the privilege of voting to determine whether the nation should go to war. Quick comment, and this is absolutely... We just did a video, AOC is talking about our revered democracy in the United States. No, if you actually let people vote on most shit in this country, we'd have a radically different set of outcomes. The people's will, the will of the working class, which is the vast majority of the population, overwhelming majority of the population does not want what's happening. What's happening in this country, the decisions that are being made benefit the small 10% or fewer ruling class at the expense of the 90% working class who have diametrically opposed economic and therefore political interests. Back to the text. There is ample precedent for restricting the voting to those affected. Many of our states have restrictions on those permitted to vote. In most, it is necessary to be able to read and write before you may vote. In some, you must own property. It would be a simple matter each year for the men coming out of military age to register in their communities as they did in the draft during the World War and be examined physically. Those who could pass and who would therefore be called upon to bear arms in the event of war would be eligible to vote in a limited plebiscite. They should be the ones to have the power to decide, and not a Congress few of whose members are within the age limit, and fewer still of whom are in physical condition to bear arms. Only those who must suffer should have the right to vote. A third step in this business of smashing the war racket is to make certain that our military forces are truly forces for defense only. At each session of Congress, the question of further naval appropriations comes up. The swivel chair admirals of Washington, and there are always a lot of them, are very adroit lobbyists, and they are smart. They don't shout that, quote, we need a lot of battleships to war on this nation or that nation. Oh no. First of all, they let it be known that America is menaced by a great naval power. Almost any day, these admirals will tell you, the great fleet of this supposed enemy will strike suddenly and annihilate 125 million people, just like that. Then they begin to cry for a larger navy. For what? To fight the enemy? Oh my, no. No, no, no. For defense purposes only. Then, incidentally, they announce maneuvers in the Pacific. For defense, uh-huh. The Pacific is a great big ocean. We have a tremendous coastline on the Pacific. Will the maneuvers be off the coast? Two or three hundred miles? No. The maneuvers will be two thousand. Yes, perhaps even thirty-five hundred miles off the coast. The Japanese, a proud people, of course, will be pleased beyond expression to see the United States fleet so close to their shores, even as pleased as would be the residents of California were they to dimly discern through the morning mist the Japanese fleet playing at war games off Los Angeles. The ships of our Navy, it can be seen, should be specifically limited by law to within 200 miles of our coastline. Had that been the law in 1898, the Maine would never have gone to Havana Harbor. She never would have been blown up. There never would have been a war with Spain with its attendant loss of life. Quick comment. Uh, that incident that started the Spanish-American War was later shown to be a uh, like some kind of an engine malfunction that made the ship blow up. It wasn't an attack. Uh, it's not known if it was deliberate, like a false flag or not. But that was not an attack. It was a, a malfunction on the ship that the U.S. got into a war over. Back to the text. 200 miles is ample in the opinion of experts for defense purposes. Our nation cannot start an offensive war if its ships can't go further than 200 miles from the coastline. Planes might be permitted to go as far as 500 miles from the coast for purposes of reconnaissance. 
and the Army should never leave the territorial limits of our nation. To summarize, three steps must be taken to smash the war racket. One, we must take the profit out of war. Two, we must permit the youth of the land who would bear arms to decide whether or not there should be war. Three, we must limit our military forces to home defense purposes. That is the end of chapter four. On to the last chapter, chapter five. One more comment from me. So these are fine ideas, these three steps, um, from a kind of idealistic point of view, meaning let's just set new policy and, you know, have those policies. The problem from a Marxist materialist perspective is that the economic engine of the country uh, that's driving all these companies and their economic interests is capitalism. And it contains a fundamental contradiction that if you actually tried to confine capitalism within those ideals, it materially will break out because capitalism will collapse under these conditions. It must keep expanding. That is the imperative or the system will collapse. So while these are fine prescriptions for peace, it will cause capitalism to collapse. Now, what does that tell us about capitalism? It's a system of misery and war. That's the only way it can exist, by perpetuating inequality and despair and ruin. That is capitalism, while providing profits for a few. So really, you know, these are fine ideals, but they're going to come against the material reality, the, the actual contradictions within the logic of capitalism, and capitalism probably will win. It just can't be constrained and the capitalists have the economic and therefore the political power to you know change were you ever to establish these laws to change them this is why as marxists we acknowledge you have to actually change the system and put the economy on a non-capitalist basis then you can have these ideals that that you know you can have policies and ideology that more closely matches peace and stability uh, rather than, you know, the despair and constant tension and crisis that capitalism produces. At least for most of us, while again, uh, very few people experience extreme affluence and pocket the profits while uh, externalizing costs onto society. All right, closing up chapter five, to hell with war. I am not a fool as to believe that war is a thing of the past. I know the people do not want war, but there is no use in saying we cannot be pushed into another war. Looking back, Woodrow Wilson was re-elected president in 1916 on a platform that he had kept us out of war, and on the implied promise that he would keep us out of war. Yet five months later, he asked Congress to declare war on Germany. In that five-month interval, commenting, that's kind of what I'm talking about, is like, you can set all the ideals that you want. Uh, capitalism will not let you stick to them. You have to get rid of capitalism. All right. In that five-month interval, the people had not been asked whether they had changed their minds. The four million young men who put on uniforms and marched or sailed away were not asked whether they wanted to go forth to suffer and die. Then what caused our government to change its mind so suddenly? Money. An allied commission, it may be recalled, came over shortly before the war declaration and called on the president. The president summoned a group of advisors. The head of the commission spoke. Stripped of its diplomatic language, this is what he told the president and his group. Quote, There is no use kidding ourselves any longer. The cause of the Allies is lost. We now owe you, American bankers, American munitions makers, American manufacturers, American speculators, American exporters, five or six billion dollars. If we lose, and without the help of the United States, we must lose, we, England, France, and Italy cannot pay back this money, and Germany won't. So, unquote, had secrecy been outlawed as far as war negotiations were concerned, and had the press been invited to be present at that conference, or had radio been available to broadcast the proceedings, America never would have entered the World War. But this conference, like all war discussions, was shrouded in utmost secrecy. When our boys were sent off to war, they were told it was a, quote, war to make the world safe for democracy and a, quote, war to end all wars. 
Well, 18 years later, the world has less of democracy than it had then. Besides, what business is it of ours whether Russia or Germany or England or France or Italy or Austria live under democracies or monarchies, whether they are fascists or communists? Our problem is to preserve our own democracy. And very little, if anything, has been accomplished to assure us that the world war was really the war to end all wars. Yes, we have had disarmament conferences and limitations of arms conferences. They don't mean a thing. One has just failed. The results of another have been nullified. We send our professional soldiers and our sailors and our politicians and our diplomats to these conferences. And what happens? The professional soldiers and sailors don't want to disarm. No admiral wants to be without a ship, and no general wants to be without a command. Both mean men without jobs. They are not for disarmament. They cannot be for limitations of arms. And at all these conferences, lurking in the background, but all powerful just the same, are the sinister agents of those who profit by war. They see to it that these conferences do not disarm or seriously limit armaments. The chief aim of any power at any of these conferences has not been to achieve disarmament to prevent war, but rather to get more armament for itself and less for any potential foe. There is only one way to disarm with any semblance of practicability. That is for all nations to get together and scrap every ship, every gun, every rifle, every tank, every warplane. Even this, if it were possible, would not be enough. The next war, according to experts, will not be fought with battleships, not by artillery, not with rifles, and not with machine guns. It will be fought with deadly chemicals and gases. Secretly, each nation is studying and perfecting newer and ghastlier means of annihilating its foes wholesale. Yes, ships will continue to be built, for the shipbuilders must make their profits and guns still will be manufactured, and powder and rifles will be made, for the munitions makers must make their huge profits. And the soldiers, of course, must wear uniforms, for the manufacturer must make their war profits too. But victory or defeat will be determined by the skill and ingenuity of our scientists. If we put them to work making poison gas and more and more fiendish mechanical and explosive instruments of destruction, they will have no time for the constructive job of building greater prosperity for all peoples. By putting them to this useful job, we can all make more money out of peace than we can out of war, even the munitions makers. So I say, to hell with war. And that is the end of the audiobook. I would just, I've pretty much given my comments. I'd just like to um, point out, I, th I thought he made a great point here in section five when he says, uh, what caused our government to change its mind so suddenly? Money. And that basically, if they didn't get in and fight the war for the Allies, uh, the debts could not be paid. So, like, basically, they had to try to win the war for the sake of uh, uh, getting the Allies to, like, pay their debts. Because if Germany wins, no one gets paid. That's just... Th that one uh, hadn't even hit me full in the face until reading it. But it's just like, Jesus... These people are even more cynical. and But see, this is why we take a materialist analysis, because, um, and I, I actually think by the end of this, Butler acknowledges, you know, you need to make material changes, and we can't just, just call for better laws. We, we do need a different system, because in the end, money talks, and if we don't change that entire system, it's going to just drown us out. And on that note, join an org, <laughs> uh, you know, keep studying socialism. For God's sake, I mean, join the Green Party if you do nothing else. But seriously, get out of the Democratic Party, uh, get out of the Republican Party, get into an independent organization that doesn't take corporate money, start fighting for socialism. Um, we need the independent left to become a fighting force to at least try to slow this thing down, at least try to slow it down. At a minimum. And if we can get more than that, if we can bring it to a complete stop and change the system, all the better. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for listening. Now to the credits. And that's the video. Thanks to our current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen or just support us financially, you can go to patreon.com slash socialism for all and sign up for a monthly donation. 
You can also follow us at facebook.com slash socialism, the number for all used to have a page at F O R all, and it got throttled to death by Zuck here on YouTube. Please click the like button, subscribe button, and the notifications bell. Please leave a comment if you can, and please share our video wherever you're online, your Twitter feed, your Discord servers, Reddit subs, etc. All of that helps more people to see this content, whether it's in the YouTube algorithm or just posting it on other sites. All of that's helpful. All of you out there supporting and promoting this content makes it all go that much more smoothly. We need to end capitalism, normalize talking about socialism today, and uh, it's really kind of our only hope for a better tomorrow. Thanks for all you do, and we will catch you in the next video.